Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. Be sure to join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Uh, you can submit questions, comments, suggest guests. Today, economist Thomas Sowell, a fellow at the Hoover Institution and the author of such classics as Basic Economics and The Vision of the Anointed. Dr. Sowell's most recent book, a revised and expanded second edition of Economic Facts and Fallacies. Tom, welcome. Thank you. Economic Facts and Fallacies, quote, Some things are believed because they are demonstrably true, but many other things are believed simply because they have been asserted repeatedly, close quote. You wish to let that gloomy observation on human nature stand? Yes. All right. Segment one, housing. Economic facts and fallacies. Quote, the biggest economic fa fallacy about housing is that affordable housing requires government intervention. Close quote. Now, Tom, Tom, I have to, I have to remonstrate with you. <laughs> no poor person would be able to live on the island of Manhattan or in the city of San Francisco if there weren't rent control or subsidized low-income housing that these cities forced builders to set aside when they built their high-rises for rich people. Isn't that manifestly true? No, it's not even remotely true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, explain. Explain. Well, first, first, first history, uh, there were more people, I believe, living in Manhattan prior to the, the rise of, of rent control and prior to the rise of government housing projects. Uh, my gosh, at one time, the Lower East Side of New York was the most tightly uh, packed uh, place in the world. Uh, New York and San Francisco have very long rent control laws, old ones and severe ones. Uh, and yet, when you look at the cities with the highest rents in the country of any major cities, they are number one, New York, and number two, San Francisco. So what's going on? Well, why, why does the political system produce a perverse outcome, which is then supported in the press? Try to mention a repeal of rent control, and the New oh, York Times will go after you immediately. Uh, ab absolutely. Well, what happens in rent control around the world, really, because it's been tried so many times, uh, is that people, uh, if the rent control is uh, severe, the people either uh, reduce the amount of housing they build, or they stop building housing altogether. Yeah. And so what happens, the political authorities are then confronted with a situation. Do you want to have a situation where there's no new housing built and the old housing is wearing out, usually faster under rent control, because the landlords don't have to keep it up as much? Uh, and so they, they step in and, they, and they'll have one, some kind of modification so that, well, let's say we're trying to protect the poor, so we won't regulate luxury housing. Of course, luxury housing and ordinary housing use many of the, much of the same labor, the same, same materials. And so therefore, all the materials that would otherwise have gone into making ordinary housing goes into building luxury housing. Mm. Uh, economic facts and fallacies once again. If we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, before government intervention became pervasive in housing markets, we find, and this is to me one of the most arresting assertions in the book, we find people paying a smaller percentage of their expenditures for housing than at the end of the 20th century. In 1901, housing costs took 23% of the average American family's spending. By 2003, it took 33% of a far larger amount of spending. What's going on? What's going on is that they're uh, restricting uh, the amount of housing that can be built. And obviously, if you restrict the supply while the demand is growing, the prices will go up through the roof. Qui bono? Who, do, who benefits from this arrangement? Politicians, most of all. How? Because they get the reputation of being for the poor and the downtrodden, and that they're, and that they're uh, setting aside affordable housing units, usually in some token amounts. Uh, they are preventing the evil landlords from raising the rent by rent control, and, uh, and they make, if they are able to keep the public paranoid that if they take off the rent control, you know, it'll be just sky-high prices. Uh, and so they, they gain by that. Okay. Both the landlords and, and the tenants lose. They lose in different ways and to different extents. Uh, the tenants lose because they can't find a place to stay. Uh, the landlords lo lose because uh, they don't make the, pro the profit they would have made otherwise. The builders lose because the, there's no demand for uh, for ha apartment buildings if they, nobody can make a profit on it. All right. Economic facts and fallacies once again. Quote, where builders are allowed to construct homes and apartments without severe government restrictions, even growing populations and rising incomes do not 
cause housing prices to shoot up because the supply of newly constructed housing keeps up with the growing demand as in Houston. Now, would you please contrast Houston with our own coastal California? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> there couldn't to be a greater contrast. an easy one. <laughs> yes, that's an easy one. <laughs> Houston doesn't even have zoning laws. But whereas to build anything in coastal California is just an ordeal. I mean, you, you have to not, not only go, you have to go through all kinds of planning commissions. I've had the misfortune of sitting in on two planning commission meetings. Uh, I don't know what it did for my blood pressure watching these people. Uh, the, the discouragement is huge. So someone estimated, for example, a real estate company that a house that would cost $155,000 in Houston would cost a million dollars in San Francisco. Right. The right. same house. Now, but Tom, what about a place like Las Vegas, mm -hmm. which overbuilt dramatically, and now there are neighbors, it's going to take who knows how many years for the already in place housing stock in Las Vegas to get purchased. Meanwhile, of course, it's declining. That was, a, we could have used a little regulation there, couldn't we? Well, the regulation was, 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 the, was one, of, one of the problems. Uh, I don't think it's going to take years. You Unless know. the government intervenes as, as, as it has to keep the prices from falling. The people who own the empty houses have every incentive to, to rent the houses for whatever they can get. Mm. Whether, whether that's, I mean, I, I had the very same problem here on the Stanford campus when I moved away. That uh, I didn't sell my house immediately and so I rented it out. And I rented it out for an amount that was $100 a month less than the mortgage payment. Because the alternative would be to have it sit empty and pay the whole mortgage payment myself. Segment two, race and economics. Economic facts and fallacies. Quote, few subjects produce more fallacies than race. Among these fallacies are that, now get ready, I'm going to give you a, a passage here. Race was the basis of slavery, that racism is the main reason for black-white differences in incomes, and in all the other aspects of life that depend on income, moreover, there is often an implicit assumption that racism and discrimination are so closely linked that they go up or down together. Now, what you have produced is a handful of outrages, and we'll take them one at a time. How's that? Race wasn't the basis of slavery? Oh, it's a, it's a simple historical matter. Uh, slavery existed for thousands of years as far back as there are any records of human beings. Uh, archaeological finds suggest that, race, race, that slavery rather, existed before human beings could read and write. So what race, a racial difference between the slaves and the enslavers, that is a relatively new phenomenon. You, you didn't have in ancient times the ability to go to another continent and move millions of people across, of a different race across the ocean. So you enslaved the people who were nearby. The Europeans enslaved Slavs for centuries before they, enslaved, before they brought the first black uh, African to the Western Hemisphere. Okay, but so you're not suggesting, you do not wish to say anything other than that slavery as practiced in the United States was, it may have been recent, but you'd, argue, you'd be willing to grant that it was particularly perverse and, and, and destructive no, it's, because, it's, because race got mixed into it at that point, right? Race got mixed into it in the United States more than anywhere else for a very simple reason. The United States was founded, as the Declaration said, uh, of the independence, said uh, men are all men are created equal. Right. If that's true, then the only way you can justify slavery is to say that some men are less than men. I see. So the racial but, in, but, in, but in Brazil, where, where Brazil imported more slaves than the United States, there was no such ideology. Brazil was not a democratic country. The whole issue never arose. I see, I see. All right, race doesn't account for differences in black-white income? No, the, the, the differences between uh, uh, income between Western Europeans and Eastern Europeans is greater than the difference between blacks and whites in the United States. Differences in income are, are, are the rule. They are not the exception. So looking at all these sociological studies that show a persistent gap mm. between African Americans in income and every other form of American in income is what, useless? It tells us things that we don't need to know. It misleads us. How would you describe that? Uh, wrong, I think, sums it up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is not true. Uh, Hispanics uh, have a lower per capita income than blacks. 
Hispanic households and families have a higher income than black uh, households and families simply because the Hispanic uh, families are, are larger. Okay. Now, this last assertion, race and discrimination, you suggest, are not so closely linked that they move up and down together. First of all, dis describe, di di distinguish the two, race and discrimination. As well, you, well, ra 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 well, racism is, is, is an attitude inside people's heads. Right. Discrimination is an overt act taking place outside in the real world. Okay. So now, and so not only with blacks, but you find the same thing with Jews in previous uh, centuries, that that part of the United States where, where there was the most racism against blacks, namely the South, right. is where black construction workers were much more common than they were in the North right on into the 20th century. Uh, and pe most people are not aware that in the South, blacks were the construction workers. I remember a professor at Howard University saying that when he was a boy in the South, his father uh, pointed to some man on the street and said, he was the first black construction, first white construction worker in this town. And so what was going on there? The racism did not, so, so whites, whites could think of blacks as somehow or other separate but they'd still employ them because, oh, yes. the, because the market made it profitable to do so. Yeah, in fact, in fact like, yes. And a, in fact, a law had to be passed to stop this because uh, in, the, in the 20s, and particularly in the, as the Depression got underway, uh, black uh, construction companies in the South using black non-union labor would come up to the North and underbid on government contracts, taking them away. And so this was, this, was ver this was very common to the point where they passed the Davis-Bacon Act which said that on government contracts, you must pay the prevailing wage, which, meant, which uh, was translated almost invariably into the union, union wage. wage right. so, so your point on the distinction between racism and discrimination is don't worry about racism. It's inside people's heads. You can't measure it. Uh, there's a strongly subjective, just forget about it. Concentrate only on discrimination. And the best answer to discrimination is to let markets operate because then people will discover, it, it will tend to militate against discrimination. Oh, yes, when people have skills to offer, they'll be employed. Whatever this notion of racism in people's heads is, don't worry about that. Is that right? Yeah, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm saying essentially is that racism, racists may prefer one race to another, but they prefer themselves to everybody else. <laughs> so they'll, they'll do what's profitable. That's right, that's right. And okay. that, that was even true in South Africa under apartheid, that there were hundreds of construction companies in South Africa that were fined in a government crackdown because they were hiring more blacks and in higher positions than they were allowed to under the apartheid law because that was where the money was. All right. Segment three, race and culture economic facts and fallacies. A fallacy is that the current fatherless family so prevalent among contemporary blacks are a legacy of slavery where families were not recognized under slavery. This ignores the fact that the problem has become much worse among generations of blacks far removed from slavery than among generations closer to the era of slavery, yes. close quote. Explain that. You mean explain why it is so, or yes? Yeah, why is that? Why? What? What on earth is going on there? That is so counter to what we what we assume. Well, first of all, the, 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 the people most people have not recognized the fact that in that if you go back into the twenties, uh, you find that uh, married couple families were much more prevalent among blacks then than today. Uh, you find also incidentally that the blacks were uh, had as late as nineteen thirty, blacks had lower unemployment rates than whites. So all these things that we complain about and, and attribute to the era of slavery, those things should have been worse in the past than in the present. Right. But in fact, they're worse in the present than in the past. And I think if you want to look for a turning point, it would be since the 1960s. And what happened in the 1960s? Oh, you began to have not only the welfare state, you began to have the, 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 the mindset that goes with the welfare state so that there was no stigma any, any longer attached, for example, to being on relief or welfare. And so, but why, well, illegitimacy is exploding now among, uh, it's high among Hispanics, yes. and it's, it's exploding among whites, but the Moynihan report, when was that, Tom? Oh, in the, the 60s, 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 65. When I Moynihan talked about the illegitimacy rate among yes. blacks, which was exploding then. So what, if the welfare state changes the way Americans think, yes. why did black Americans prove susceptible to that change first? Because they were poorer. 
I, I don't think that many uh, uh, Asian American girls who are preparing to go off to Stanford or Harvard are, are, are going to uh, say, hey, well, I, I can live on welfare. Why should I uh, uh, abstain? So it's nothing to do with slavery, or at least it's less to do with slavery than it is yes, to do with what, yes, we, with the yeah. with what we have willfully yeah. constructed since. Once again, crime. Once again, economic facts and fallacies. The history of crime and violence among blacks contradicts many widespread beliefs about the causes. Crime among black, black Americans, like crime among white Americans, was declining for years prior to the decade of the 1960s. But it was during the 1960s that crime rates began skyrocketing among both blacks and whites. And it was after the historic civil rights laws were passed that blacks began rioting in cities across the country. Yes. Again, the night this is just, you know, well, actually, not only do you know it, but you relish, <laughs> you relish how contrarian this is to everything we think we understand. How, what, what happens in the 1960s that leads to rioting? Uh, for one thing, uh, the, justi oh, the, 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 the uh, justification of rioting, for one thing. Uh, uh, and, and the holding back of the police. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest, uh, the biggest riots in terms of deaths occurred in Detroit. And uh, the governor sent in uh, troops, but he sent them with, with uh, strict orders to hold off and so on. Uh, and once the, once the rioters, who were just a small percentage of the population of the black community, once they saw that the police weren't going to do anything, they ran amok. I contrast that to, with Chicago, where I still remember the original Mayor Daley coming on uh, television and saying, I have instructed my police in case of riots to shoot to kill. Uh, there was horror across the country. People f didn't notice that there were far fewer deaths in Chicago than there were in places where the mayor came on and pleaded with people to behave and said, I understand your problems and all of that kind of stuff, none of which stops riots. Although Detroit, once again, economic facts and fallacies, although Detroit had the worst of the riots, <clears throat> the poverty rate among Detroit's black population was only half of that of blacks nationwide. Its home ownership rate among blacks was the highest in the country, and its unemployment rate was 3.4% lower than among whites nationwide. Detroit did not have a massive riot because it was an economic disaster area. It became an economic disaster area after the riots. Yes. So again, what, what, what causes these riots? Once they get started, the governor does the wrong thing. Yes. But what starts them? Oh, anything can start a riot. The question is, how do you stop them? And uh, James Q. Wilson once said, the only thing that will stop the riot, uh, a riot is overwhelming force on the scene. But you see, the, the, what, if, if you put overwhelming force on the scene, that will, that will indeed stop the riot cold. But then the next day, the newspapers will say, why, was, why did the police overreact? I mean, there, there was just a little disturbance, and here come these tons of cops. Right, right. Um, here's a, once again, race and culture, economic facts and fallacies. Race is used as a sorting device for decision-making, even by people who are not racists. Thus, employers may be reluctant to hire young black males because these employers are aware of what a high proportion of them have been arrested or imprisoned, even if the employers have no antipathy to black people as such and readily hire older blacks or black females, close quote. Are you saying that discrimination, even on the basis of race, you're saying it can be rational. Mm -hmm. Do you want to suggest that it can be acceptable? Well, that, that's a different question. Yes, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do notice that... Uh, uh, among a group of, em of, of uh, employers who routinely check everyone for prison records, the hiring of young black males is greater than in the employers in general. Whereas once they realize... If they find somebody whose record is clean, they'll take him. Yes. All right. Segment four. Facts and fallacies potpourri. There are too many, <laughs> there are too, too many of these. Um, income inequality. Uh, yes. Okay, listen to Paul Krugman. Your favorite economist, didn't I hear you say that no, one? No, 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 not, not, not unless I was absolutely on LSD or <laughs> my mind has gone completely. All right. Paul Krugman writing in, the New York, in his New York Times blog, quote, since the late 1970s, the America I knew has unraveled. You, 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 might, you might be willing to take that. As, 
We're no longer a middle class society in oh. which the benefits of economic growth are widely shared. Between 1979 and 2005, the real income of the median household rose only 13%, but the income of the richest one tenth of one percent of Americans rose 296%. Close quote. The rich are not only getting richer, they're becoming dramatically richer while everybody else is treading water. <laughs> I love it. Well, all I have to hear is the word household income, and I know we're not serious. Why? Because households differ over time in size. They differ from one group to another uh, in size. And they differ from one income level to another in size. For example, uh, in the bottom 20% of households, there are 39 million people. In the top 20% of households, there are 64 million people. Over time, the house households have been declining in size. So if you had a household in which, uh, at some point in the past, there were three working adults, right, uh, and now the household has only two working adults, and the family is making the same money they always made, that is not stagnation. That is a 50% increase in per capita income, which may be why one of the adults goes off and establishes his own household. He can afford to. So household income are uh, utter nonsense. If you're serious, you look at per capita income because per capita means one person, and it always means one person. It doesn't mean one person in 1980 another, and one and a half persons in 1930. And so it always means one person. So if you're looking for a legitimate comparison, that's what you do. If you're looking to score political points, you go to household income and family income, and voila, you have your political points. All right. On per capita income, how's the country doing? I haven't checked the latest figure, I'm sure. I, I know that in terms of uh, real per capita income, uh, the average income today will buy less than it could last year. I, I don't usually make predictions, but I suspect it will buy less next year. All right. <clears throat> we'll come to the pessimism of Dr. Thomas Sowell in, uh, soon enough. Um, income inequality in women, economic facts and fallacies, Given the numerous factors that impact the incomes and employment of women differently from the way they impact the incomes and employment of men, it can hardly be surprising that there have been substantial income differences between the sexes. Okay, not quite as outrageous as you often are. Here it comes. Nor can all these differences be assumed to be negative on net balance for women. Close quote. Tom, you look at the difference in income between men, higher, women, lower, and you suggest that on average, women may actually be better off, or many women may be better off. You have to explain yourself. Well, yeah, if you're making comparisons, again, you, have to have, you can't compare apples and oranges. Uh, when I was doing a research for that particular chapter, I remember being amazed that there was a large difference in uh, income between young male physicians and young female physicians. Uh, until I dug into the data and discovered that young male physicians work more than 500 hours a year more than young female physicians. If you work 500 extra hours, chances are you'll get paid more. And if you, as you go through many of the other differences, you find all kinds of explanations of that sort. All right. Um, last item in the potpourri. The university in contemporary America. Now, don't get misty-eyed. <laughs> Economic facts and fallacies, quote, in general, the way that higher education is financed, including the nonprofit status of most academic institutions, gives decision makers in academia far greater latitude in deciding what to do than is the case in enterprises whose survival depends on accommodating both those who receive their goods and services and those who supply the money. It is therefore not very surprising that many of the decisions made in the academic world serve the interests of those who make the decisions. Close quote. You've been an academic virtually all your professional life. Let's just begin with the baseline question. If you had it to do over again, would you do it differently? If I had it, I've thought about that a lot. Have you really? Yes, because when I, I was... I thought I would be asking you a question no, that would catch you by surprise. No, no. I, I, Hard I, to do with you, Tom. My, during my first month as an undergraduate at Harvard, I received a, a letter forwarded from Washington offering me a job as a photographer. And I've often thought, if I could go back to that time, would I, in fact, uh, drop out of Harvard and go take the job, or would I continue slogging on? Uh, and I'd probably drop, drop out and go take the job. Would you really? Yes. So 
academia, there's a kind of, there's a corrupting influence here. They get money to a large extent from government, all the student loans. Well, all of it was the government is redistributing income from ordinary working Joes to fancy professors, fundamentally, is what's going on and has been going on for decades. Correct? Yeah, and, and, and of course, to the students. And to the students. Who, who, who riot when, 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 when not enough of the taxpayers' money is, is given to them. Has academia in America become, I don't even know quite how to ask the question, has it become more irresponsible? Did it reach a low point in the 60s and it's been recovering since? How do you think of it in those terms? Over, well, I, think, I, I, I think it, there was a break point in the 60s. Uh, I'm not sure it's recovered. I know in the 70s there was a lot of self-congratulation that we no longer have violence on campus. Uh, yes, the campus was, was, was quiet, but it was the quiet of surrender mm -hmm. because people who would uh, cause people to riot were not invited on campus. People who would antagonize the students by their viewpoints were not hired as professors. One of the reasons uh, why a few years ago when uh, the think tanks of the world were ranked, and I, Hoover was ranked number one, but most of the leading think tanks uh, in those rankings were conservative think tanks. And I think there's a very simple reason for it. The kinds of uh, top scholars who would normally be in academia were not in academia. And this is one of the places they could go and work uh, with the kind of freedom that academic uh, tenure is supposed to provide, but doesn't. Segment five, the prospect for the future. You begin economic facts and fallacies with two quotations. One is the frontispiece for the whole book, and the other heads the first chapter. John Adams, your first quotation. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Second quotation, economist Henry Rozovsky, quote, never underestimate the difficulty of changing false beliefs by facts, close quote. Now here's what throws me, Tom. That first quotation, John Adams, is a fundamentally optimistic quotation. John Adams is, of course, a Democrat. He helps to found the country. And in all his writing, all his life, he has this basic faith that people exposed to the facts and the evidence will come around and assimilate those facts and evidence and make decisions based on them. The second quotation couldn't be more pessimistic. Never underestimate the difficulty of changing false beliefs by facts. So on the scale of optimistic John Adams to pessimistic Henry Rosofsky, where's Tom Sowell? Well, I'm right there with Henry Rosofsky, or perhaps a little to his right. Oh, come you want it? <laughs> You were supposed to say you're right in the middle. You're way over here. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, we're raising whole generations uh, who, 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 who regard facts as more or less optional. Um, you have kids in, the, in, the, in elementary school who are being urged to take stands on political issues, to write letters to congressmen and presidents about nuclear energy. You know, you know that I need not a decade old. And they're, and they're being thrown these kinds of questions that could uh, absorb the lifetime of a very brilliant and learned man. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're being taught that it's important to have views, and they're not being taught that it's important to know what you're talking about. It's important to hear the opposite viewpoint, and more important, to learn how to distinguish whether, why viewpoint A and viewpoint B are different and which one has the most evidence or logic behind it. They disregard that. They hear something, and they hear some rhetoric, and they run with it. Tom, <clears throat> you saw the election of Barack Obama as a triumph of sheer vacuous hopefulness yeah. over seriousness and realism. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Since then, his, he's elected in November 2008, we've seen the emergence of the Tea Party, the recapturing of the House of Representatives by a large Republican majority. Just days ago, Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin puts forward a budget proposal that I think you consider serious and far-reaching. Have these events, let's put it this way, has the reaction to Barack Obama encouraged you about the state of the United States? I, I always believe that there have been pockets of sanity. Uh, but uh, there, there is, it, it is by no means a foregone conclusion that he will not be reelected next year. Mm. Pockets of sanity is the best we can hope for? 
Well, it's the best we've seen thus far now. I, you know, I'm always happy to see some miracle, uh, some uh, knight in shining armor right, riding out of the wilderness. Tom, one of the most, um, you write a lot about uh, race and economic mm -hmm. facts and fallacies, and we've gone through that in this discussion. And frankly, it's heartbreaking. It is. We think we've made progress. Uh huh. And the reverse is true in many ways. Yeah, we've the made progress. Array. We've made Go progress ahead. in some respects. We've had painful retrogressions. I think. I think in terms of education, there's no question in my mind that kids who grew up where I grew up in Harlem don't get nearly the education that I got when I was growing up there. Okay, so let me put this question to you uh, with regard to race. John, you remember John Rawls and his famous veil of ignorance. Oh, yes. If, it, if, you, if all you, so let's just say that you're an African-American child about to be born. Mm -hmm. Do you choose 1930, 1930s America, the year in which you were born, mm. or do you choose America in 2011? I'm afraid that if, you, if, you're not, if you're not born in the South, you would, you, if you, you, would, you, would, you, would choose, you would you would choose in the 1930s. You would. In the 1940s, New York had one of the finest public education systems in the country. Uh, I was and I, I came up from Charlotte, North Carolina, where kids from Charlotte. How were, old were you when you came up? Nine, nine years old. Okay, so kids were, were routinely put back a year when they came moved from Charlotte to New York. The latest information I have on education is that uh, among the major cities in the country, Charlotte is now number one. New York is way down the list. Mm, mm. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Thomas Sowell, appearing on this program just over two years ago, quote, there is such a thing as a point of no return. Mm. Uh, if Obama won the White House, you said he would pursue disastrous economic policies. I suppose you think he's done just that. Oh, yes. I, I'm, I'm one of the few people who's not disappointed in him. <laughs> you know, now, this, I, it, this should be depressing, but I find myself laughing over and over again. It's, as I say, it's either that or tears. Yet the economic policies you said a little over two years ago, quote, will pale by comparison to what they will do in permitting countries to acquire nuclear weapons. Once that happens, we're at the point of no return. Close quote. Yes. That hasn't happened. As far as we know, Iran still doesn't have nuclear weapons. Just give me your general view of the state of the country right now. Let's start with foreign policy, since that's what you focused on a couple of, of years ago. Well, you know, Theodore Roosevelt said his foreign policy was to speak loudly and carry a little stick. Obama's foreign policy in Libya has been to speak loudly and carry a little stick. I'm sorry. I, the I, other I, way around. It's the other way around. He speaks softly and carry a big stick. Right. Obama speaks loudly and carries a little stick. And we see the disaster that's starting to unfold in Libya as a result. Uh, with regard to economic policy? Oh, my gosh. I mean, uh, George W. Bush in eight years ran up a record-breaking uh, addition to the national debt. Obama has topped that in just two years. And, and no sign of it's coming down. And no sign of it's coming down. Um, <clears throat> I feel we're out of time. I feel a tremendous impulse to try to find some question that will permit you to end on a sunny, upbeat note. Ask me how old I am. <laughs> how old are you, Tom? I am 80 years old, and that means that I may well not be spared seeing where all this is going to lead. <laughs> Tom Sowell, I'll cry after the cameras stop rolling. <laughs> Dr. Thomas Sowell, author of many books, but most recently this revised edition of Economic Facts and Fallacies. Tom, thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.